Hello everyone and welcome to another SDF COVID webinar. Today it's interrupting transmission, um, drugs, HIV and COVID. We'll be discussing the ongoing HIV outbreak amongst people who inject drugs and the impact of COVID on HIV testing, treatment and prevention. I'm Leon Wiley, I'm Lead Officer at Hepatitis Scotland and I'm also co-chair of the Sexual Health and Bloodborne Virus National Prevention Leads. Uh, the, the current COVID pre situation presents unique challenges to maintaining access to testing and treatment for people who inject drugs. We're aiming to bring in today, bring a national perspective through highlighting local responses to overcoming COVID related service restrictions and hopefully help with the development of creative solutions that can benefit service user health needs. We're focusing on HIV today as although all BBV testing has suffered greatly due to the COVID restrictions, in the short term, HIV is potentially the greatest negative health and prevention impact if testing does stop. So pragmatic considerations due to changes in access to services and staff really need to be considered when assessing how to maintain testing and what should actually be prioritised. So when you're assessing a hierarchy of current short-term risk, HIV testing therefore probably assumes a bit of a greater priority than hepatitis C testing. It's partly to do with access to treatment, but also the current, the different health trajectories and time spans involved across the viruses. But it's only through continued early identification and access to antiretroviral treatment can reductions in HIV incidence and mortality be achieved and a wider HIV outbreak amongst people who inject drugs avoided. Um, we've got three speakers today who will give us a 10 minute presentation followed by a Q&A session at the end. Attendees online now can submit questions throughout the webinar. The questions tab appears on the control panel which should be on the right side of your screen now. My co-chair Leslie Bond who's the National Training and Development Officer in the SDF Harm Reduction and SHBBB team will then join us for the discussion session at the end and she'll summarise the questions being asked of the speakers and put them to them. Our first speaker is Andrew McCauley. He's also my co-chair of the SHBBV Prevention Leads and he's Principal Healthcare Scientist in SHBBV with um, Health Protection Scotland, Public Health Scotland. Then we'll hear from Rebecca, from Becky Metcalf, a consultant in sexual health and HIV with NHS GGC and also Con Lafferty, who's a BBV prevention nurse with the assertive outreach team, which is inclusion outreach, the harm reduction team in Lothian. So first of all, I'll hand you over to Andy um, and put him on next. Thank you. Thanks, Leon. Uh, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is my first experience of the SDF webinars, so uh, it's uh, nice to be asked along to talk about uh, talk about HIV and the outbreak in Glasgow that we've all been working on uh, for such a long period of time now. Uh, my job really today is to set the scene with some of the epidemiology associated with the outbreak and I'll also finish off with just some reflections uh, as part of my role as co-chair of the, the prevention leads on some of the, the challenges I think uh, the outbreak might be facing in relation to the COVID-19 pandemic that we're all living through at the moment. So next slide please. So I think it's always important to remind ourselves of uh, the, the cornerstones of HIV prevention, uh, which have uh, been well evidence-based over the past uh, 30 years or so. Uh, principally, uh, good uh, adequate coverage of needle and syringe provision and opiate substitution therapy. Uh, it's well documented that these interventions, when used in combination, uh, and when people are given adequate needle and syringes for every injection and uh, optimal opiate substitution therapy dosing, these uh, interventions in combination can have very, uh, very effective outcomes at reducing uh, an individual's uh, risk of infection and also an individual's risk of uh, transmitting uh, infection. Also, uh, in relation to that, if we add uh, HIV testing and treatment into the mix, uh, also known as HIV uh, treatment as prevention, uh, these interventions can also provide a important additional preventative benefit uh, for individuals uh, getting HIV, but also transmitting HIV uh, onto individuals in their peer networks. Uh, 
it's also important just to recognise there are other social and structural interventions, perhaps not as well evidence-based in relation to HIV uh, incidence or transmission, uh, but I've got an important role to play, and these include uh, drug consumption rooms, which Glasgow has been uh, trying to implement for a number of years now, and other peer-driven uh, interventions uh, which exist uh, out there. Next slide, please. So I suppose, again, it's important to remind ourselves why we're all here uh, and what we're talking about uh, and how historic this HIV outbreak is in relation to uh, the HIV epidemiology uh, in Glasgow, but also in Scotland and the UK as a whole. So this graph, uh, I suppose, clearly illustrates the outbreak period, uh, the onset of which was very late 2014, early 2015 and which has really been uh, persistent now for a period of five or six years. Usually with infectious disease outbreaks, uh, you see the onset of them happening fairly quickly. Uh, a number of control mechanisms are put into place, and uh, the graph uh, comes back, regresses back to the mean, if you like, very uh, soon after. This outbreak has been quite different in terms of its trajectory. It was very uh, sharp at the beginning. Uh, a background of HIV, new HIV diagnoses and in people inject drugs of typically around 10 per year, uh, to just under 50 new diagnoses recorded in 2015. And although numbers have come down slowly since then, uh, the, we're still very much within uh, an outbreak scenario at the moment and still very much uh, have evidence of ongoing transmission in this population, including very much uh, evidence of uh, recent transmission, so recent infections being acquired. We haven't put the 2020 data onto this graph, but uh, you can be assured that there are uh, ongoing transmissions uh, in 2020 at a level that are well above average. The other important point from this graph is if you look at the peak uh, in 2015, if you just simply draw a line straight back from that, uh, this uh, this outbreak uh, is larger than anything we've seen uh, back in uh, the 1980s when HIV uh, it was very much identified uh, uh, in Scotland at that time amongst people in inject drugs. The main epidemics at that time being in the cities of Edinburgh and Dundee. Glasgow also had its own spike uh, then, but not to the same extent we've seen uh, in the east of the country. Next slide, please. So, from certainly from my perspective, from a kind of scientific or epidemiological perspective, uh, it was important to know not just the information uh, about the early cases in the outbreak and about how many new diagnoses we had. It was important to know what the the burden of infection was uh, on the wider population of people who inject drugs in Glasgow. Uh, so that includes not just people diagnosed, but people undiagnosed as well out there. And we were also interested in uh, what individual and environmental factors had contributed to the onset of the outbreak, but also to its persistence. What were the key drivers uh, behind the outbreak? Next slide, please. So the way we measure that and monitor that is through a study called the Needle Exchange Surveillance Initiative, a study we manage uh, through our team at Glasgow Caledonian University. Uh, more people will be familiar uh, to the study as the NESI study where we send a team of researchers every two years across uh, mainland Scotland to interview people who inject drugs when they're accessing injecting equipment or opiate substitution therapy, typically within community pharmacies. Uh, and at the same time as interviewing them and helping them to complete a questionnaire, we take a dry blood spot sample. And it is that dry blood spot sample we use uh, to test for HIV antibodies. We also test for uh, hepatitis C uh, antibodies and uh, RNA as well to help us monitor hepatitis C in the population. But this, uh, this research uh, has been instrumental in helping us understand the scale of the outbreak and how it's impacted on the wider a population of people inject drugs in Glasgow. And you can see from this slide that in the short space of only really five years, really between 2011 and 12 to 2017, HIV prevalence within Glasgow city centre, which is very much the epicentre of the outbreak, uh, increased tenfold from around 1% uh, to 11%. Uh, and that is a fairly uh, seismic uh, increase, uh, given we had seen very static prevalence uh, in this population in this area 
uh, for around 30 years. And this represents the largest HIV outbreak in this population, not just in Glasgow, not just in Scotland, but in the UK uh, for over 30 years. Next slide, please. Uh, and when we looked at the individual and environmental factors associated with infection, uh, when we, we we detected this this increase when we studied this uh, over the past couple of years, uh, a few key factors really stood out. Uh, these weren't necessarily new to us because a lot of the interviews with the early diagnosis cases in the outbreak reported uh, similar things, but we were able to now properly quantify these uh, across the whole population and determine the size of these risk factors uh, when taking into account other known risk factors uh, for HIV. So by far and away, the largest uh, uh, independent predictor of HIV infection in this population in Glasgow uh, was cocaine injecting. People who injected cocaine uh, had around seven times more odds of being infected with HIV than people who didn't inject cocaine. And that's not just people who are injecting cocaine exclusively. Uh, as many of us know, working in this field, people typically inject cocaine uh, alongside other drugs, uh, including heroin and other consumption of benzodiazepines and alcohol and others. Homelessness was also a, a strong predictor of infection. Uh, those uh, who had experienced homelessness in the last six months had three times more odds of being infected with HIV uh, than those who hadn't. And again, this shouldn't come as a surprise, uh, given uh, one of the first detections of the outbreak was within uh, individuals uh, known to the Simon community uh, in the city, and they've been uh, instrumental in helping uh, the response uh, since then. And then also frequent incarceration uh, was identified as a risk factor. Uh, and this perhaps shouldn't be a surprise, as we know that many of the populations uh, we work with on a day-to-day -day basis have had some sort of experience uh, of incarceration, uh, either recently uh, or in the past. But by frequent incarceration, we're talking about individuals that have been incarcerated five or more times uh, in their lifetime. Uh, and these individuals were more at risk of infection. Next slide, please. So I think we wanted to use today to just update people on the current situation, uh, because it's not always that clear what the current situation is, because sometimes there is a bit of a lag period with the data. So next slide, please. So this just really updates you on where uh, we are in comparison to that previous slide uh, that I showed. So obviously we had had that tenfold increase in HIV infection uh, in Glasgow city centre between 2011-12 and 2017-18. We recently completed an SE field work uh, on our most recent iteration uh, of the study. Uh, we completed that field work in Glasgow in September last year, uh, which feels like a lifetime ago now since COVID-19 came in. Uh, and what we've been able to determine is that HIV prevalence uh, in the population in Glasgow has plateaued probably for the first time uh, in a long time, which is an indication that uh, there's there is a degree of control uh, in uh, the amount of HIV, uh, which is, uh, or the reservoir of infection in the city in terms of uh, how HIV has been spreading. And that's largely a reflection of uh, the fairly intensive uh, response mechanisms that have been put in uh, across the city, including expanding IEP provision and uh, the, the, the remodeling of the treatment and care service from a, a more of a hospital-based service to a more community-facing service, which Becky, I'm sure, will talk about uh, in a moment or two. So this is really good news uh, that uh, HIV infection in Glasgow City Centre appears to have levelled off. It's not coming down, and I think we need to remember that, uh, but it's important to know that the trajectory has not continued to increase uh, since the last time we did that study. Uh, Next slide, please. So as I've said, the epidemic is in Glasgow city centre, and this is my very poor attempt at drawing maps and trying to highlight where the hotspots are on infection. Uh, and it is reassuring to see that there has been a plateauing uh, of uh, HIV prevalence in the city centre. But if we go to the next slide, we can see where our challenges uh, have come now. What the recent NESI study was able to demonstrate that while HIV prevalence in Glasgow city centre had plateaued, we now had very clear evidence of hotspots of undiagnosed infection outside of the city centre. So uh, to the north of the city centre, uh, we picked up particular hotspots uh, of infection there. Uh, 
and to the south of the city centre uh, in the Renfrewshire area, we also picked up hotspots uh, of infection there. Uh, and importantly, these infections are undiagnosed. And by undiagnosed, these are people when we've asked them the question in the interview, do you have HIV? Uh, they've responded no, but the results come back uh, and has, uh, has tested positive. And we've been able to do further validation checks at HPS in the background to identify if these individuals are previously known to the service. So these are, we are fairly confident these are proper hotspots of undiagnosed infection. And this information has been fed back to the health board and they've been working hard to try and identify the individuals uh, involved uh, in these areas where undiagnosed infection occurs. The one to the bottom right of the map is not technically NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde. Uh, unfortunately, we've also been able to identify uh, fairly significant areas of undiagnosed infection spilling over to the NHS Lanarkshire area, uh, particularly the area that borders uh, Greater Glasgow and Clyde. Uh, and again, this is uh, concerning because it gives us an indication that uh, the outbreak is is drifting uh, away from the city and centre into more outlying areas uh, and uh, really emphasises the need to put prevention and control measures uh, across the health board and not uh, solely focused on the city centre uh, because we do have this uh, evidence that HIV prevalence is increasing uh, in these other areas. Next slide, please. So just to finish off the wider context, we'd obviously, until COVID-19 came in, there were many people working hard in the HIV outbreak response, whether it was from the public health perspective, the clinical perspective, or through the third sector perspective, including the street outreach work. But we have all these other things that have come in now that are really challenging our ability to work in this area and perhaps going to cause us further challenges in the future uh, when uh, the COVID-19 restrictions are lifted. That includes limited HIV testing opportunities. The HIV testing, not just in Glasgow, but across the country, has been significantly scaled back because of the social distancing that's in place. IEP provision uh, has dropped uh, across the country by up to 50% in some areas, slightly less in Glasgow, I should say. Uh, the reduced uh, the reduced daily dispensing of OST uh, is good for some people. Uh, certainly, it's created an opportunity for people to move on to weekly dispensing. Uh, but uh, the, the caveat to that is that there's reduced monitoring of OST. There's also reduced monitoring of antiretroviral therapy that goes alongside the daily dispensing. Uh, so there's potential issues in relation to compliance there. Uh, and then just the general less footfall in addiction services, so less opportunistic kind of day-to-day -day review with individuals, just touching base with them, how they do and how's their general health, how's their mental health, and engaging uh, with them in that way. Uh, and the same goes for outreach and support. Uh, and then we do hear anecdotal evidence of people's income uh, opportunities are significantly reduced, whether it's to do with street begging or whether it's to do with other uh, opportunities because of the lack of uh, individuals in the city centre these days uh, and there has been anecdotal evidence of potentially increased sex work and that obviously puts people uh, at risk of HIV. It's not just an injecting risk outbreak, there's also a significant sexual risk component to it. So these are maybe things we want to touch on today. And okay. I think that's Thanks, me, Liam. Thanks. Thank you very much for that, Andy. That gives us a, a wider range um, of what's been happening and I'm sure there'll be some questions related to other areas in that. Um, and I encourage everyone on the channels there to, um, down on your right-hand side, um, to look and, um, and ask any questions, which we'll put to the panel later on. But um, now let's go from the wider perspective to a more Glasgow-based perspective, and we'll ask Becky Metcalf to do the next um, talk, and she'll be looking at what's the challenges Glasgow have had and then and what they've done to overcome them in the last wee period due to COVID. Thank you, Becky. Hi, thanks for uh, having me today. And uh, that's a really nice introduction by Andy, who's, who's essentially given you the background uh, of what we've been dealing with in Glasgow uh, for, since we were alerted to the outbreak, uh, which is five years ago now. This has resulted in a, a quite a large cohort of people who inject drugs living with HIV in Glasgow. And it's important to remember, although we're hitting about 170 diagnoses since 2015, and we, we group them together by the type of virus um, that, that they've acquired, because there's different 
types of, of HIV viruses, but also um, in, if they fit the demographic. So a lot of people have acquired HIV through sharing of equipment and injecting drugs, but um, in some cases it's been through sexual exposure as well. And now they're all in that group. So that's 170, as it would be the kind of, of formal numbers. But we also have lots of people here in this group who were diagnosed with HIV before 2014. Uh, and we still we look after those patients as well. So this is quite a large group that we've really had to ad adapt our clinical response to. Um, Andy touched on it there, but we, we realised quite quickly um, when we were managing this group that that the, the care we were currently providing, which is in a hospital setting, an outpatient hospital setting in the west end of Glasgow, just wasn't suitable for their needs. They had complex and social needs, and a lot of them were living homeless, as, as um, Andy said, or in touch with other services. So we managed to adapt the service to provide that care. And we adapted the, the HIV or blood one virus clinical service, but hand in hand with HIV treatment comes prevention, uh, because we, don't, we wanted to manage the outbreak and prevent onward transmission. So we also adapted the, the sexual health and HIV prevention service as well. In order to do that, we had to change our clinic model. And, and many of you will be aware from other talks that we have great uh, nursing support, our clinical nurse specialists who've done a lot of outreach work and um, literally outreach on the street or have held clinics and lots of other services. And over time, we've developed uh, an in-reach clinic at Hunter Street Homeless Services and worked very closely with the homeless addiction team there. And that's been really successful. We've also more recently, given what Andy's just said about, about Renfrewshire, we started uh, doing a clinic out in Renfrewshire um, and uh, have really good links with other um, CAT teams in the alcohol and drug services within Glasgow. And that, that sort of partnership working has really been invaluable to how we've been able to uh, manage people and, and really provide um, antiretroviral therapy to anyone who's been diagnosed with HIV and ensure they had access to that and access to us as, as a clinical team. We did always have clinics and prisons, but we've really increased that and put, had a more of an HIV focus on that because traditionally that was mostly hep C focused. Um, so also on top of that, one of the key aspects and probably the really big thing that's helped us with this treatment is prevention that Andy talked about. So we're providing treatment, but we want people to be able to take it easily. We don't want them to have to um, it to be a burden. It should fit in with what they're doing with, with the rest of, of their life. Uh, and we also want them to be able to adhere to it on a daily basis. So we started community dispensed supervised antiretroviral therapy alongside um, methadone in community pharmacies. And we started that in about as, a, as a pilot in July 2016. And that's been really, really successful. And we've got good evidence to show that when people are engaging with that, that they are able to adhere on a daily basis. Uh, we can record that through the pharmacist and also the, the virus remains suppressed. We've also done some HIV testing drives through the um, through the, the kind of more the sexual health the prevention team and led by public health. Uh, and again, that's been really key in improving HIV testing across all of the places where where we've been pointed out, either through work that Andy's done through Nessie or or just from our partnership services, where we've been able to increase the awareness of HIV and increase the rates of HIV testing. So if you go to the next slide. I'm going to just touch on how these things have been affected in the last two and a half months because of COVID and they have all been significantly affected. So as I'm sure where, where all of you work, we were very, very quickly forced to, to change what we do. Uh, and so our, our HIV and BBB outreach team very quickly were unable to do home visits. We're unable to pop into hostels or hotels to see people. We, the clinics that we do, in uh, certainly in Renfrew, we were unable to do that. Um, and at the homeless um, health service, although we did it, there's much less foot, footfall in the clinic because as you all know, across addiction services have had to adapt how they work and have ha having much less face-to-face -face interactions with their clients. So then we're not able to see them as well. The, the change in the OST delivery that Andy alluded to, so instead of getting it daily, most people were given perhaps weekly or or twice a week for example and therefore that has actually had an impact on the, the ART delivery. In most cases community pharmacists were very good at matching them up but in some cases the ART was kind of forgotten about and some doses were missed uh, or, the, or it led to confusion uh, and I think that that's just a sign of how quickly we all had to adapt and everyone was put under pressure to adapt their services. In order to get around that we we were we really did benefit from the fact we already had really good relationships with lots of other services. So 
with all the community pharmacists, with um, addiction services, with other third sector outreach teams like Simon Community especially, we have really care um, with outreach pharmacists. So we, our, our nurses and our whole team, the frequent, frequent communication with other services specifically about our patients um, has helped us solve some of these issues, but it has been a challenge. We realised very quickly, probably within the first couple of weeks after lockdown, that um, HIV testing was going to be affected. Um, we also realised that, that with the decreased footfall in the clinic that um, and the decrease in outreach services, that our patients weren't going to be able to get the same support that they rely on so heavily. Um, so we've done a bit of work in expanding uh, our sexual health and HIV prevention outreach team. And this is one of our key members, Lindsay, down the bottom right. Uh, and we've worked really closely with um, John Campbell uh, from our harm reduction manager and also Turning Point to, to provide an outreach service where we're still with a focus on testing, uh, but also addressing any other sexual health need. Um, I, I'm, I'm a big believer that although we can, when, when HIV testing is really key and it's key to early diagnosis and giving treatment, but we also need to combine that with all the other parts of prevention. Um, and we know Andy's just said about the decrease in IEP and OST. Um, and but there's other things that we can do, and, and I think this is why um, I get when we look at that graph that Andy showed about how this is the the biggest outbreak in a long time compared to the 80s. We're in a much better position with HIV prevention now than we were um, all that time ago, and we should really be focusing on the things that we can do and we should we can take to people to prevent HIV transmission in the first place. Um, one of those things is, is HIV prep, pre-exposure prophylaxis, which some of you may have heard, and the majority of people who who um, get that in, in Scotland are um, uh, it's for sexual exposure and, and, and for MSM, and that's because they're a high prevalence group. But Andy has quite nicely shown you that the prevalence of HIV amongst people who inject drugs in Glasgow is up over 10%. So they're a high prevalence group. So if anyone is having sex with someone from that group, then, then PrEP might work as well. So we, we've been kind of pushing that in Glasgow, and we noticed that um, there was anecdotally more reports of, of sex work. People had less money from begging so there was uh, more reports of sex in exchange for drugs or money or um or summer sleep so with that and the decrease in testing it really made us feel like there was a big need for a sexual health hiv prevention team getting out and about and finding people and i'm pleased to say that we're now two weeks into that and um, that's lindsay in, in the harm reduction van which you probably know is very active in the evenings in glasgow but it, it wasn't during the day it sat in the car park at, at glasgow drug crisis center so we're we've been taking that out during the day and um taking it to outside to hostels with permission and obviously discussion with management at the hostels um or to certain places and publicising it as somewhere that, that a, essentially a clinic room on wheels that someone can come have an early assessment testing we, we can do testing on the van dry blood spot testing but also discuss any other sexual health needs and other hiv prevention needs our main aim here is to signpost to other places so um uh, especially when it comes to to um iep and if anyone needs help with with um ost or linking in with addictions we can do that and then any more complex needs we tend to signpost up to up to hunter street where we've got a better clinical setup and um, we've done this with a lot of work with everybody in the community but also with the, the thought in mind that safety of everyone is paramount and that's the patients that we see and also our staff uh, and we think this can be implemented with good social distancing measures good use of ppe uh with with very careful consideration of all of those things um and we have actually managed to we, we had early indications that bbv testing was really very low in these settings in glasgow and over the last couple of weeks i'm pleased to say that we've managed to um to do quite a few tests and then most people that we see are very keen to be tested um, so if you just go to my next slide i suppose the key issues from our experience here um, are that that i'm really concerned having been involved in this for a couple of years that a reduction in hiv testing for those where who we know the impact of covid19 is going to be huge these are already the most marginalized in our society and they're even more marginalized by by what's happening just now um the the reduction in IEP or the, the 
the ability to stand in line outside a pharmacy to get IEP or to, um, to access outreach services or third sector services that are normally so heavily relied on does make me worry that the people who are already at risk are now at very high risk of HIV acquisition. And I would say that HIV testing is an essential service. Um, it, and as already highlighted, we, we know that early HIV diagnosis and linkage into care is better per personally for medical benefit for the person, but also to reduce transmission and is a big factor with us when it comes to controlling the ongoing HIV outbreak that we're struggling with in Glasgow. Um, it does mean the COVID-19 restrictions do mean there's less harm reduction measures. And I'm sorry, there's a typo in the slide. What I meant to say is that those at highest risk must have access to services. Um, and we can deliver that in a really careful way. Um, we have been really careful and thoughtful about how we will test someone, how you get closer than two metres, screening questions, using adequate PPE, just thinking really carefully infection control measures but it can be done and I would suggest that um, if you're seeing anyone face to face for any reason or doing any other medical input that BBV HIV testing is pretty key. We've also considered using some incentives and we've done that in the past uh, so vouchers for testing and we have them and we may do it but at the minute we're, we're being so successful in our testing last couple of weeks that we haven't needed to use that yet uh, and but I would consider that other services consider consider that and offering uh, homeless accommodations or other places for, for you to come in if they've got adequate clinical space is also a safe way of doing that too. So I think that's my time up so thank you. Cool thanks Becky that was great there was some really interesting stuff in there especially about the way in which you've looked at, at delivering testing out with you know having the vans a real yeah. important thing there which has been great. Okay I'll now move over to Con Lafferty from um, his BBB prevention um, nurse with um, Lothian Inclusion Service, and he's going to be speaking from his phone. So he's, um, I don't think we've got camera from him. Um, I can't quite see on here, but um, but he'll be speaking to what's been happening in Lothian with, and with regards to what they've been doing and their adaptation to the current response. Thank you, Con. Uh, hi, um, sorry, I'm, I'm Con from the harm reduction team. And Lothian, uh, thanks for inviting me uh, to speak at this webinar. Um, just like everybody else who's speaking, um, we have had to adapt quickly to um, provide services to those during this COVID phase. And um, we have been working in partnership with Sexual Health to and, and the Bloodborne Virus Team to, to develop the Lothian Inclusion Outreach Service. Um, could you move over to the next slide? Okay, so one of the, the main reasons uh, for setting up the clinic uh, was because we we were seeing oh, oh sorry oh, sorry we were seeing uh, lower numbers of IEP transactions across the board, and um, there was various reasons for this. Um, some of the pharmacies were stopped providing IEP. Um, some of the pharmacies have stopped recording IEP and there was just less attendances as well and with that of course comes the increased risk of equipment sharing so we were were uh, are worried that there is a potential risk for an increase in bloodborne virus um, uh, positive bloodborne virus testing so um the the our labs had stopped providing a, a analysis analysis uh, uh, sorry i'm trying to say this word stopped analyzing um the dry blood spot test so they were halted for a while so um and also a lot of the sexual health services were reduced as well so and um, can you move over to the next slide please so an, an order to uh, an, uh, to, to make sure that services were still provided, uh, the Lovian Inclusion Outreach Service was set up. Um, so there was various aims for the service. Uh, what, one of the main aims was to ensure uh, there was still access to injecting equipment within high risk areas. So that would be places like the hotels that were set up within Edinburgh to house all the homeless people. Um, also, we wanted to ensure um, that the bloodborne virus testing was um, was still being provided to these people. So what 
we have started providing as point of care tests through this client group. So the point of care tests, similar to the dry blood spot tests, they are it's still like a finger prick test. However, um, we can provide them with the results for the Hep C virus within 20 minutes and the HIV virus within um, 60 seconds. Um, there are some limitations to those tests. So the, the hepatitis C test, um, it only tests for the antibodies. And um, whereas the, H, the HIV test, um, we, we would just say reactive as well. Um, this is because um, they are around 99% effective, but th there can be around 1% of people that give a false positive result. Um, also within the service, we want to um, signpost people to um, opiate substitute therapy treatment. Um, Lauren Gibson and Joe Tay, uh, and I've been working alongside them, have developed a clinic uh, every Thursday that gets people um, into rapid OST treatment. Um, so those who, who have a GP but aren't in treatment or on a waiting list at present. Um, also, from the sexual health side of things, uh, we've been going out and assessing any sexual health needs of, the, of any clients that we see. Um, sexual health is there of a reduced service. Um, it, it could be that some medications like abortion medication and things like that may be delivered to people and ensure tests are still being conducted as well. But so far, what we've seen is that the, 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 the most of the clients we've engaged with, uh, they're not sexually active. Um, and, and they're not really in, in need of that service. Um, so, um, could you move over to the next slide, please? So, um, to set this, we, we had to set this clinic up quite quickly. So, um, Avon Care, alongside feedback from, from other people involved, developed the, the standing operating procedure very quickly. Uh, and we also expedited the process for um, uh, getting staff trained in the point of care tests. So what we did is if anybody who was dry blood spot uh, testing trained already, um, they didn't need to be mentored um, on how to deliver these tests. Um, so um, basically we just got all the staff running um, from one session of training. Um, when, when two staff are required to go out to all times with solo protect alarms um, and the, the risk is uh, ongoing. Um, when we're out in these hostels and hotels, well, we're, when we're in the hotel, we're just in uh, one of the hotel rooms. So, um, and we're not near any other staff. So it's really important that we have two members of staff. Also, the social distancing is impossible so full PPE has to be worn at all times. We're also auditing it by, by um, we're recording all the information um, weekly onto spreadsheets and, and onto track as well. Um, could you move on to the next slide, please? So the clinic now, the outreach service now has been running for three weeks. And in that time, it's been used 20 times by 19 uh, individual clients. Um, could you move on to the next slide, please? So uh, in the space of three weeks, we have managed to do nine um, point of care HCV tests and um, 13 of the HIV tests. Um, the reason that the HIV test is higher is because the Hep C test only tests for the antibodies. A lot of people that we're engaging with um, have already previously been in contact with the HCV, with hepatitis C, um, or, or some of them uh, have already been tested and they, they're positive for the antigen and they are just awaiting um, treatment, that they will be picked up as, 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 soon, as soon as they can. Um, out of the nine people that we have um, done a Hep C, POCT test with, um, four of those have tested antibody positive and none of them were aware that they've been in touch with the infection. In those instances, we, we, we will take full bloods from them 
and then send them to to the lab. So we are just awaiting, awaiting results for those or follow up from them. Uh, we have seen no um, reactive tests whatsoever for the HIV. So uh, um, one of the things we were worried is the potential for, for, for an outbreak here, but it doesn't seem that we, we are seeing a similar picture to um, the, the HIV endemic within Glasgow. Um, so other services we've been providing is IP. Uh, I've been providing wound care to people where possible when, when we've been out. Um, I've been providing hepatitis B vaccinations to those who have um, who have not received those, and um, also given out naloxone and harm reduction advice. Um, okay, could we move on to the the next slide, please? Um, what one of the things we are seeing is a lot of risky injecting behaviour being reported. So, out of the um, nineteen people that we've seen. Um, 10 of those have reported um, an, um, indirect sharing within the last month, and four of those have reported directly sharing needles within the past month. Um, and, um, you know, but a lot of places are still providing, they, they do still have access to injecting equipment, and I have been using the one hit kits as a means to providing, uh, providing IP to these people while we've been going out. Um, could you move on to the next slide, please? So some some other points uh, of notice from when we we have been engaging with these clients um, during outreach is that many of them seem to be in need of mental health support, and a lot of them are reporting having difficulties um, getting that support at present. Um, as I mentioned before, most are reporting not being sexually active, so the sexual health for sure is secondary to, to, their, um, to their, their drug use. Um, there's also concerns after lockdown um, has ended where the people in these hotels are going to be housed. So, um, you know, the hostels we're going to, a lot of people will still have a roof over their head, but in the hotels when lockdown uh, ends, what, what where, where, what, what's going to happen to these people that have been temporarily housed in, in, in the hotels? Are they just going to put them back on the street? Um, but yeah, so so far it's, it's, it's been a successful service. Uh, we're, we're going to continue it uh, uh, and, and just keep monitoring it and uh, we'll feed back to, to people any findings that we, we find. Thank you, Con. Um, so I apologise every bit there to everyone for some of the sound issues we had during that time. Um, could I invite all the presenters to come on screen and to Leslie as well, please? Um, if you can put yourselves on screen. Hello, 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 hello. And Con, if you stay there and listen, um, please, and we'll put some questions to you as well. Um, so I'll, so there's been questions coming in um, while the panelists have been talking and I'll get Leslie to put them there. Thanks. Hi, thanks. Um, so first off, we have some questions asking about cocaine injecting and why this leads to higher risk of HIV. And linking to um, someone else's question, is there any link to NPS injecting when that was a trend maybe going back about five years ago? Okay, do you want okay, me to take that one? Oh, sorry. I was just going to suggest you, Andy. <laughs> I'll start with you and then I'll move on to Becky and then to Con as well. All three of you, I think, on this one. Thanks. Sorry, I broke protocol there. I know I need to go through you first, Leon. <laughs> uh, so cocaine injecting is a long, a, a long known uh, risk factor for uh, HIV, even going back to the, the Vancouver studies from the 90s. And uh, in, uh, in Glasgow, we're specifically talking about powder cocaine injecting, not crack cocaine injecting. So it's a risk factor because cocaine is a stimulant uh, and uh, stimulants uh, have a shorter half-life than opiates. So people uh, tend to use cocaine and inject cocaine more frequently and more frequent injection is uh, associated with higher risk behaviours. So sharing of equipment, reuse of equipment. Uh, also, cocaine uh, increases your libido, so people are more sexually active. 
uh, when they are using cocaine. So if uh, we know HIV uh, is at risk of being transmitted sexually as well as through injecting, so cocaine has that double risk in terms of increasing your injecting risk, but also your sexual risk. And then finally, there is also good data to show that people who inject cocaine have poorer compliance with drug treatment services, particularly OST services. So they are much more likely to uh, move in and out of treatment uh, frequently uh, and compliance is an issue. So cocaine is a particularly bad drug in the midst of an HIV outbreak in terms of the triple risk it presents. Okay, thanks, um, thanks Andy and Becky. Yeah, I think I would just echo what Andy says, but from a clinical perspective, you know, we get, you know, people um, will tell us that they have to have uh, more frequent injections and also, of course, the, the sexual component as well. And that's really important to stress and what we see in Glasgow. And we probably didn't pick up on it immediately, but this, there is definitely a sexual component to to the HIV outbreak and HIV transmissions, although it's always it's sometimes difficult to pull apart. And um, what I can say is what we see from some of our more stable, longer diagnosed patients who are maybe very well linked in with addictions and maybe stable on an OST um, dose is that that they'd still struggle with cooking and um, continue to still inject it. They can't get the same hits from using it any other way, and um, they still they still need to to use that. So yeah, it's still a very active active problem. Obviously there's a bit of a difference between Lothian and Glasgow in that sense in that, that Lothian there's been a lot more crack smoking going on. So Con, is there anything you want to add? We, we are mostly seeing a uh, crack cocaine smoker but, but um, just reiterating what said when people are injecting cocaine they tend to binge on it uh, and so th therefore they're injecting more frequently and, mm. and that would be oh. one of the biggest reasons for, for us seeing any um, HCV infections. I mean, you know, we had the huge issue here with people injecting um, NPS, and there was a massive spike in hepatitis C. And but so, we were getting reports of people injecting that up to thirty times a day. Um, when people inject stimulate stimulants, particularly uh, cocaine, um, it's very short lived. They get this short lived rush, they call it, and they, they they just chase that. So so they will be injected more frequently. And of course, um, it increases their libido as well. Okay, I'm just wondering as a follow up to that, has anyone seen potentially when you've got a respiratory infection um, and a respiratory risk obviously there, are people moving towards injecting rather than smoking at this point? Um, I mean, there, there are, a, I've not had anybody report moving to injecting specifically because they have a respiratory problem. Um, we, we do get a lot of people who say they don't like smoking, um, but no, I've not, I've not had anybody say that they've moved over to injecting for that specific reason. Okay, okay, thank you. Um, Andy, did you want to add anything today? You had your hand up for a sec. No, I think Cohen touched on it. It was just to be, I, I realised I didn't answer the question about NPS and it was just to reaffirm that there's no NPS link to the Glasgow outbreak at all, although NPS was a significant factor in the spike in HCV and Lothian eh, a few years ago. Cool. Okay, we'll go back to Leslie again. Thank you. Um, next up is a question that's coming in asking about um, given the current situation in COVID has on testing and prevention, are we expecting HIV rates to increase in the future? Mm. <laughs> Who wants to feel that one first? <laughs> I mean, I, I can I can go first. I Andy probably has a, a a much better idea of this than me, but from I, I think so. Yes, I think from our perspective, from what we see in Glasgow. Uh, the number of tests that we see coming through the lab are so much lower and we know that's a factor. We know that decreased testing is a factor um, because people aren't diagnosed and they're un unwittingly transmitting on infections. Um, there's two things. We may, when we start testing again, then we may see the spike that we always get with any infection because you're testing for it. Uh, but then there's also, um, we'll be able to see how many of those have been reached for new, new transmissions. But um, uh, personally, I think given what we saw right up to this and that we were still seeing recent diagnosis, people, uh, or sorry, recent infections, people getting diagnosed quickly despite being tested and then suddenly it stopped, I think it's inevitable that we'll see a spike again. But Andy? Yeah, I would agree with that. I think uh, 
I think if we, if we think about the reservoir of infection, as we call it in Glasgow, the reservoir of infection, if you think about at least the prevalence being 10%, the reservoir of infection is high. So it, it doesn't take much now for an injecting episode to be a transmission episode because the reservoir of infection is high. Uh, and the the longer we go without having a kind of sufficient testing program in place, mm -hmm. the more undiagnosed infections we miss and we miss getting them at an early stage. So then that increases just further risk of onward transmission. So I think we're, we're doing great to maintain, uh, and I know Becky and John and others are, are getting a testing program back up and running, but we're still a long way off where we were uh, before this happened. So the quicker we can get uh, that back in place, uh, the better. And Becky's right, we'll more than likely see another kind of spike of some degree uh, when things do normalize in terms of testing. And then it, I suppose it's our job to make sure that that comes back down and stays back down. Which was one of the drivers of putting this on today, which was that, to highlight that that is a key issue that we think really needs to be addressed nationally because um, potentially moving out with and so, as such. Okay, Leslie, the next one. Okay, we've had quite a few questions about testing. Um, so I'm going to just try and touch on all the things that have been discussed in regards to testing questions. So first of all, I've got questions about how testing will go, um, will look going forward, and um, what PPE will be involved for workers that will be doing tests in um, care services. Also, a question about um, our third sector partners who have launched the um, home testing kits service today and also our other third sector partner THD who's done it historically Waverley Care and HIV Scotland have launched a new service today around home testing is that something that could be utilized to increase testing and um, the third point on this is how do we ensure equity of testing in different areas as well not all health boards not all areas are doing things like um, point of care testing. So a few different testing questions there for you. Okay, um, I'll go to the practitioner first, that way. Yeah, <laughs> sure. Um, so I'll try and answer them in order and remind me if I forget. Uh, so testing going forward, I mean, I suppose we don't know, but I think realistically in the, on the, in the clinics, we don't really expect to suddenly go back to normal very soon. I, sus I suspect there'll be social distancing and mask wearing for quite a long time. What we're suggesting now is that is that it's normal infection control, gloves and apron, but with, with the, the fluid resistant surgical mask as well is in place for less, if you're going less than two meters to someone. Um, and that's what you should be wearing if you're if you're conducting a test. And that's certainly what our group um, are, are using. Um, I don't think that's gonna change for a long time. To be honest, um, it still doesn't mean you can't do the test. Though tests are very, very quick. Uh, dry blood spot test. We prefer dry blood spot tests because then, of course, we can get Hep C as well. Although, you know, I appreciate the access to treatments stalled at the minute. Uh, but also, it gives us. It's a much more reliable test. Point of care, as as Colin said, is is very good, but has got some limitations. Um, uh, ideally, it's been a puncture, but really, a DBS can be done very, very quickly. Uh, and that's what you want to do with the testing. You want to be perfect. Make sure that you've got the right kind of PPE on, PP on to protect yourself, but also to protect the patient. Uh, but make sure that when you're using that time efficiently, so um, you're doing the best test, that you're going to get the best outcome. So we would say a DBST for that. Um, I, but yes, um, Waverly Care and, and HIV Scotland have, have launched the online uh, testing service which is brilliant, it's really, really good. Um, what I would say is it, it could be used. I think my concern in the group that we are targeting in Glasgow is that you have to, well, have access to at least a phone, but ideally online internet access, uh, a, a secure postal address or a reliable one that you can get something posted out to. Uh, it's, it's just HIV and, and you know, be able to do it yourself and then send it back. And also the, the motivation uh, and to do that. And one of the things that we've come across when we do our prevention work in the city is that people aren't always aware of their HIV risk um, or they certainly don't prioritise it because we've got so many other complex issues affecting them. And, and it's really up to us as clinicians to educate and kind of get them to think about their HIV risk and why we're doing that, do a test at the same time. Um, and, and that sort of brings you back to the equity of testing, isn't it? I mean, we're, we're, we're going to 
probably struggle across the city, but especially or across the country, but especially even just within the city from people who are able to navigate what the NHS, which is pretty complex at the best of times, but is even more complex now. And these kind of online initiatives, which are really fantastic, uh, but also there's people who, who can't do that. And I suppose that's what we're trying to do in Glasgow is to, to say, look, we've got another service. We will come to you. Uh, we'll provide options for you. Um, because it's got, it's inevitable there's going to be an equity, I think. Okay, thank you, Becky. Um, Andy, do you have anything to add to that? Like, um, because there's been a massive drop off in testing, so it's um. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so I suppose as part of Leon and I's work as co-chairs of the prevention leads, and if we think about also the sexual health and bloodborne virus strategic leads, this is a key issue for them. The drop off in bloodborne virus testing, not just in uh, the the drug user population, but other populations as well, because of the knock on effects of that. So what I would say to people is 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 to shout as loud as you can locally that these are priority services. It was. It was inevitable some services were deprioritized when the the COVID-19 issues hit everybody and uh, drug user services were not immune to that uh, but we're now in a place where things are starting to get looked at to get brought back in so use things like the letter that came out from the deputy cmo and the minister for public health saying that services for alcohol and drug users were a priority use that this is a bloodborne virus service we're talking about but it's a service principally for drug users to so use that as as a tool to get a to bang against the door uh, of people locally to get services reprioritised. And I would also encourage people to use the guidance that SDF have helped pull together uh, on maintaining uh, levels of service during the pandemic and mitigating the impact. I think that's available on the SDF website and that covers bloodborne virus testing. Cool. Okay, so th that's great, Andy, and thank you all. Um, unfortunately, we've come to the end of the webinar because of the time. We only had the hour, but this has been recorded and will be published on the SDF YouTube channel, hopefully including replies to any of the other questions we didn't have time to answer, get to today. We'll also send out an evaluation. It'd be excellent if you could complete this for us. The next webinar will be held next Friday, 22nd of May at 1 p.m. Topic will be um, drug treatment and contingency planning in Scottish prisons under COVID. A link to the register will, of the webinar will be in the evaluation email you receive. So finally, I'd like to thank very much all for attending and a special thanks to today's speakers, Andy McCauley, Becky Metcalf and Con Rafferty for what's been a very informative and engaging session. And I hope you all think about how we can deliver testing in a way that we can um, keep, have health equity for all. And thanks again, everyone for attending and thanks to the speakers. And thank you, Leslie. Um, for questions to, together and thank you very much to the organisers. Goodbye. Thank you.